Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Diesel Creek. Today, we're going to be talking about the most versatile piece of equipment in my arsenal and one that I personally couldn't live without. And if I had to have just one piece of equipment, this would definitely have to be it. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, the skid loader. During the course of this video, you might hear me refer to the skid loader as a Bobcat, but that's just like a Kleenex tissue thing for me. This is a Bobcat brand machine. I do not necessarily say that Bobcats are the best. They have their issues, but all manufacturers do. So we're going to leave brand loyalty out of this video, or at least I'm going to attempt to. And we're just going to talk about the pros and cons of uh, different setups of equipment and what you should be looking for if you're going to go out and buy a machine. And I highly recommend you do. <clears throat> it's been a couple weeks since I've uh, last run this machine. And the... Uh, alternator wasn't charging the last time I was running it and I think the battery was getting low so uh, fingers crossed that it actually starts right now So in case anybody's interested, this tractor that I just unloaded off my trailer here, or what's left of this tractor, this is the uh, Farm All A that my buddy picked up at the beginning of the year. I did a quick little video on it, and uh, once we got into it, you know, we quick re quick re bleh, quickly realized that uh, this thing's really just too far gone. It's not even not even that great of a parts tractor, honestly. The radiator's probably the only great thing on it. It's got one good tire, a set of wheel weights, and a rear lift that are, you know, worth what he paid for it. But the block, I've never seen a block that bad. The camshaft's completely pitted over, so is the crank. It's just a, a nightmare. But anyway, on to the topic of this video. So, back onto the focal point of this video. Um, whatever you want to call this piece of machinery, people call them bobcats, skid loaders, uh, skid steers, uh, CTLs, or compact track loaders. Uh, they have a variety of different names, probably a lot that I'm not even knowing because I'm just from Pennsylvania. You know, I know there's a lot of guys watch this channel that are from all over the world and they call them different things in different places. Okay, sir, if you're in the market for one of these machines, uh, there are several different setups that you could buy and, you know, they all come with their own set of issues. Really not too much variation between the whole bunch of them, but, you know, uh, you're gonna to wanna to get the right machine for what you're doing with it. So the big difference in between a skid steer, skid loader, or a CTL compact track loader is rubber tires versus rubber tracks. Now, we're not gonna get into it, but you can also take off these tires and bolt a track system on that's aftermarket. That's a whole different video. Uh, but this machine came from the factory with rubber tires. This is a Bobcat S185. And in the Bobcat series, uh, they don't have a, a track machine, and this same size would be a T190. Don't ask me why all their numbers are the way they are, but uh, about the same size machine as a T190 in a Bobcat, but it would come with the factory rubber tracks on it. So, the difference between rubber tires and tracks is massive, okay? If you're doing a lot of grading work or moving dirt, or spreading stone, anything like that, where you need that stability to be able to cut a nice grade and keep things smooth, rubber tracks are a huge advantage compared to rubber tires. Now, that being said, track machines are considerably more money compared to a rubber tire machine like this. So you gotta really weigh that out. Do you have to have rubber tracks? No, uh, before rubber tracks got popular, everybody did everything with these machines. 
you know, maybe a little slower, takes a little longer, a little more finesse, a little more skill, but you can do it. Everybody asks me about these steel tracks. Now these ones are made by Grouser brand and these obviously just go over the rubber tires and uh, they are fantastic. They're a little noisy. Everybody complains in the videos that these tracks are noisy and they need oiled. Unfortunately, there's no way to really lubricate these. They're an open bushing. So if you put any oil in them, the dirt just wipes it right out of there almost instantly. So these are a tremendous upgrade when doing dirt work or working on slopes or in really soft ground. Tremendous upgrade over rubber tires. Uh, even just on like muddy ground right here, the rubber tires will start spinning and make a mess. And it's just, these, these tracks really are a game changer. So that's one option you can look at. If you don't want to spend the coin to get a dedicated rubber track machine, uh, I picked this setup used off of Facebook Marketplace for I think $800 or $1,000 and uh, they still have paint on the side so they were like new. So there's your undercarriage differences. Now the other big difference in machines is this setup back here. This area of the machine uh, is your boom. So this arm goes up and down. This is a vertical lift style of machine. So as you can see the arm comes back here and goes into this linkage. And when this cylinder goes up, this linkage actually moves back, which keeps the bucket. When you lift the bucket on this machine, it stays in the exact same plane. It doesn't go out further or come in closer to the machine as you lift up and down. The other type of machine has a little bit different setup back here, and that's called a radial lift machine. This arm would run straight back into one pivot right about here, and it would just hinge. So when you have a fixed boom point like that that hinges, now you have the bucket makes a radius and it will actually go further and closer to the machine throughout the radius of lift. I hope that makes sense. It's the best way I can illustrate it. Now I am partial to the vertical lift because I think it just takes some of the brain work out of doing certain things. Uh, you don't have to think about, okay, by the time I lift up four foot, I'm going to be six inches closer to whatever I'm you know, loading into or setting something on or whatever like that. It just takes some of your brain out of it. Um, but it does become second nature after you run one for so long. I think you get a little bit more lift height out of these style machines, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the disadvantage to one of these styles of machines is you have more pivot points now. So instead of coming back here to one pivot point, now you've got two on each side that you uh, wouldn't have with a regular style of machine. So if you're looking at one of these, do cosmetics matter? This rust down here, does that really matter? Not really, it's really personal preference. But however somebody maintains their machine can tell you a lot about how they maintain the mechanics of it too. Now in my case, I don't worry about cosmetics. I keep the machine mechanically sound. When things break, I, I fix them as fast as possible. Um, the paint, unfortunately, I don't make as much time for. This heavy as steel is not gonna rust away like it would if this was your car and this was bare metal. You know, your car's gonna rot away within a couple years, at least in this part of the country. But heavy steel like this with no paint on it, it's not gonna go anywhere for quite a long time. So I guess we'll just start here at the front of the machine and go all the way around at things that I would look at when I show up to look at a machine. So right here, this is your quick attach plate. This is independent from this. This plate sets inside of this channel here and engages with these levers. Now these levers, often on a lot of neglected machines, are pretty well seized up. These ones here, as you can see, move really easy. Now what that does is that pulls that pin right there out of the attachment plate. So if those don't move very easily, uh, they probably don't switch attachments very often with their machine, and uh, they can be a pain to get freed up and moving again, but most of the time you can get them loosened back up and cleaned up and working correctly. So this is what they call a manual style quick coupler or quick attach, whatever you want to call it. Um, some machines, instead of having these manual handles like I have, will have either an electric linear actuator in this area or a hydraulic cylinder that you can just push a button from in the cab and it will open those uh, pins up and you can drop off your attachment and switch to something else. Also on the front of the machine here, this is where most of the motion happens on a machine. Uh, your boom goes up and down, sure, and that, that moves a lot, but your bucket moving back and forth, that's a, a bit more movement. That These pins and bushings receive a good bit more movement 
than the ones at the back of the loader arm. So you're going to want to check the pins and bushings, especially down here where they attach to the loader arm. Uh, these things, you got to grease them constantly and they will start to get slop in them. So here's a better view of these pins and bushings. You can kind of see mine are starting to get a little bit of wear in them right here. This pin looks like it's rocking around inside of this plate and uh, it's not supposed to move there. So if this part of the plate gets sloppy, you really can't even uh, factory put a bushing in that. That's uh, not supposed to wear at all. So what that's doing is just hammering over time. That's hammering out the metal in this fit and uh, causing some slop there. So the only way to really fix that would be to either A, buy a new plate, a new quick attach plate from the manufacturer, which would be outrageously expensive, or take this to a machine shop and have them weld the bore up and drill it back out for you. Same goes for this fit down here, which is the one that really receives the most abuse in my opinion. Uh, these ones I have put new pins and bushings in within the last six, 800 hours, and already they're starting to get a little bit of slop in them, and I do grease them religiously. Uh, they are due for it right now, but I promise I do grease them. No, it really pays off to take a buddy with you or something when you go to look at a machine like this. Because you can be running the machine or your buddy can be running the machine and one of you can be outside the machine watching all the pivots for slop. There's a lot of things moving right now, but what we're looking at is right where this quick attach plate attaches to the loader arm that has a little bit of up and down movement in it. Now that means that we're getting some wear in there, but it's not super bad just yet. How big a deal is it if those bushings are worn out? Well, that just depends on your level of mechanical ability or what you're paying for the machine if it's worth it to send it to the shop and get those bushings replaced or you do it yourself. Uh, parts for something like that typically aren't too expensive because it's a common wear item and there's really just not much to them. I guess the next thing we'll do is go into the cab here. Now, there's a few different configurations of controls in a machine like this. Mine is the one that I prefer, but we'll talk about the rest of them here. Obviously, when looking at a piece of equipment, if the inside of the cab is just really torn up or all rusted out or filled with junk, you know, that to me that says something about the way that machine was maintained. This one here spent a good majority of its life outside before I owned it and even after I owned it, it's spent a lot of time outside. I only recently have gotten a building for it to live in now. Um, so consequently, it is a little, little messed up. It's very dirty at the moment. This poor thing does need a bath. Terrible. Um, you can see some of the fabric in the back of the cab here is peeled up I guess just from the moisture getting to it nothing super critical though I did just replace the bottom seat cushion as some of you may have seen so the seats are tore up those are not a cheap thing to replace so uh, if you're gonna be spending a lot of time in one of these machines you want to make sure you got someplace comfortable to sit so the, a tore up seat really does count for something in my book now that we're inside the machine here uh, we're gonna talk about creature comforts so as I just said you want to make sure you have a comfortable place to sit now, newer, modern machines, a lot of them have heat, AC, radio, all the, the whole thing just like your car does. This machine, while it has a thermostat over here, it doesn't move. It's always on hot, and uh, there's no AC in this machine. It has a variable speed for the fan, and that's all I got. So in the wintertime, the machine's great, but in the summertime, uh, even with the fan off, it, it's still pretty warm in here, and that's with no front door and the windows open. In a Bobcat and uh, most other brand of machines, there's different configurations you can get for your instrument clusters. Uh, the newer the machine, the more advanced they're going to be. This one here is uh, pretty much as advanced as you could get for the time. This is a 2003 model, and this has keyless start. So now that we're in the control panel, we can see all of our gauges here. And after we'd start the machine, you know, the oil pressure will come up, the hydraulic temperature will come up, and uh, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of cool tools that you can go through the menu here and use 
and uh, you know so that counts for a good bit in my opinion the lower model the lower trim models of these machines just have a regular old ignition switch over here nothing fancy you're gonna want to make sure all your gauges work obviously check out all that stuff the instrumentation make sure it works uh, make sure your headlights work all that stuff counts for something the little things you're just gonna to want to check everything in the machine for functionality Onto the control systems now. There's different names for the control systems. People call them different things. Um, I can I call this H pattern what I run. Um, so basically, you have a lever for each side of the machine. So you push this one forward and backward, it makes this side of the tires go forward or backward. So when you push them both forward, the whole machine goes forward. If you push them both backwards, the whole machine goes backwards. If you push one forward and one backwards, you're going to twist and do a 180. That's just your directional travel. Now with an H pattern, you have this motion right here is what controls your tilt. And this over here is what runs your boom. So when you work those together, I can be nice and smooth with my hands. The other option that this machine has is foot controls. So now I'm not gonna touch anything, but I can still run the boom and the forks using just my feet. And now these, where my hands are at, simply do the directions forward and backward. I don't like foot controls. I'm not very smooth with them. That's probably just because I've never spent enough time running them. But uh, my feet are kind of big to really fit down in the foot wells, so I think that's also part of my problem. So I, I will never buy a machine that has just foot controls. I've found some killer deals on nice machines that have foot controls, and I still won't bring myself to buy them because I just don't feel that I'm comfortable running them. Now the third style of bucket controls that I don't have here to show you are called pilot controls or ISO controls. Same thing, you have two joysticks just like this, but instead of having all this travel here for your forward and backwards, you don't have any of that. You have a joystick over here and a joystick over here. This joystick on an ISO machine will handle all of your boom functions. So this is your curl just like this one, and then forward and backward is your boom up and down. And this one over here handles all of your travel functions, you know, forward, backward, left and right. Now, that is indeed the smoothest and probably the, the most universal way to run a skid steer these days. All modern machines on most construction sites uh, have ISO, at least the ones I go to. There are people that still run foot controls or H pattern like this, but it's definitely becoming the norm to have ISO controls. The thing I do not like about ISO controls are your directional travel. The boom function in one controller is great. I have no issues with that. But having your left and right controls as well as forward and backward in one controls leaves you less control of your sides of the machine, basically. So with this style of control, if I'm pushing this controller forward and that side starts to slip, I can feel the resistance come off of this controller because you, you have a little bit of resistance. It's pushing back against you as you're pushing it forward. But the moment that side starts to slip and lose traction, I can feel that and I can compensate by pushing this one a little bit harder and usually get myself unstuck before I ever get stuck, if that makes sense. When you have an ISO machine that you're just pushing this thing forward, you don't have that fine finesse and control you might notice that you're starting to slip and spin, but there's really, other than to just turn the opposite direction of the slippage, you don't have a way to make that one side run faster than the other side. All that being said, I'd still rather have an ISO machine than this. When I buy a new machine, it's going to be a track machine with ISO controls. Now, a lot of the modern machines also have a pattern changer in them. Just like this one does, I can switch between the hand and the foot controls a lot of the new ones have the ISO controls that you can also switch into the H pattern like I have here except for you don't have this big range of motion you just have the joysticks tilt forward and backwards and that does give you the independent control of your tracks like I'm talking about. As we start to work around the machine here uh, you're gonna stop here at your auxiliary block now I, I'm pretty sure all modern machines have auxiliary hydraulics they still list it in the uh, machinery trader like it's some sort of option, but I've never seen a machine that doesn't have some sort of auxiliaries. Now, whether you have just two auxiliaries, this one here has a third valve, 
Um, and then a lot of machines will have even more than that. And, you know, I have an electrical hookup here that it's missing too, but there is an electrical coupler that plugged in here and you have uh, servos on your attachments sometimes that will allow you to run more hydraulic functions without having all those extra plumbing out here. So this machine is what they call a standard flow hydraulic pump as well. Some machines have a higher flow pump or even a secondary pump that will produce a much greater flow of hydraulic fluid for your attachments you're running. All my attachments are standard flow, so like that auger over there, I think this machine runs between 17 and 20 gallons a minute of uh, hydraulic flow for the attachments, and that is more than capable of running like an auger or I have a, a, a brush cutter that's designed for standard flow. I have a grapple over there. Standard flow, no issues. But if you get into something like a, a road milling head or a high flow brush cutter or a forestry mulch or something like that, those all typically demand high flow hydraulics, which... Um, I don't know how many gallons they usually flow. I think they're upwards of 40 to 50 gallons uh, a minute. So that's a, a quite a jump up over one of these machines. But you can get this exact same model machine with high flows. It's just an option. So if you are buying a rubber tire machine, obviously your treads on your tires matter. These tires are not cheap. They're not little car tires. They're going to run you... $200 a piece at least for good ones. You want to make sure if you're buying tires for a skid loader you get ones with good heavy sidewalls because that's typically where you're going to blow them out at. Uh, rocks and stuff get in here and slice up your sidewalls and then all of a sudden poof and if you get a flat tire on one of these things you're not going anywhere. And if you are buying a machine like this that has tracks on it, these over the tire tracks, my personal preference here, and you're welcome to argue with me in the comments, is this style here. And there's a couple different manufacturers that make ones that look just like this. These are cast steel, and they have a hard link in here with a bronze bushing in between these two links here, and they're adjustable. So to tighten these tracks, you just take that bolt out, squeeze these together, and put the bolt here in this next hole, and that'll tighten up the tracks a little bit. But these style of over-the-tire tracks are the ones to go with. They're nice and heavy, which gives you more stability and counterweight, and they wear like iron. I mean, I've run these things for a thousand hours on this machine, and I really don't notice any wear to them at all. The bushings might be starting to wear a little bit, but it's not a big deal. You can go rebush and uh, put new bolts and bushings in the whole track system for, you know, a couple hundred dollars, and it'd be like new again. I don't think you're really going to wear these out unless you're doing some crazy stuff, but... The other brands of these things are fabricated. So what that means is somebody in a factory somewhere puts pieces of cut steel, regular, well, I don't know if it's mild steel or if it is some sort of anti-wear steel, but they put it in a jig and they weld it together. And I've seen a lot of those wear out really quickly and they get bent up and broken. And I don't, I think you see them also wearing out tires. The people I bought this machine off of, I used to work for, and they had those style of tracks on these machines. And they did not like those tracks at all. They threw them away, and uh, they said they were just eating tires when they were running those style of tracks. So, me personally, I'll stay away from them, but I've had nothing but good luck with these tracks. As you're coming around the machine, you're going to be looking at all your hydraulic lines over here. So, like, this guy here, see how that's wiggling around right there? That used to have a piece of plastic that held it, just like this guy. But obviously it caught on something or just got brittle and broke from age. And it looks like I need to pick up one of those things. And it's a simple repair. All you do is zap this thing off of here, put the new plastic retainer on there, and screw it back on. But stuff like that, that matters because uh, that flopping around like that for a long time will eventually wear through one of these lines where it's rubbing here. And these hard lines are quite expensive. You're going to want to be checking all your fittings as you're coming around here, making sure all these uh, pivots have been greased recently. If you see one that's real dry and doesn't look like it's had grease in forever, probably a good chance that uh, they haven't greased it. Probably a good chance that it's wore out because it hasn't had grease in quite a while. Now that we're back here at our first lift cylinder, you're going to want to check a look just like this. This cylinder isn't leaking yet. It might be starting to get a little damp, as they call it, but it's not actually leaking hydraulic fluid out of it. All this grease and oil and wet stuff you can see here is just grease that's over time worked its way down around the top of the cylinder here. And when I steam clean it, that should all go away and that should look nice and dry again. This particular machine has a sight glass down here that shows you your hydraulic oil level. 
so they get full of dirt so you clean it off as best you can and there's a little ball floating in there i'm not sure if you guys are going to be able to see but there's a small ball that floats in the sight glass and we'll show you the level this one is still over full uh, but does leak a little bit so that's why i have it over full so we looked at our cylinders they're nice and dry at least this one is you're going to want to be looking at all your hydraulic lines the soft lines as well as we keep continuing around the machine here these ones have abrasion covers on them so that's good that keeps the uv the sunlight off of them because uv does kill rubber hoses as well as snags and just abrasion from them rubbing on each other because this arm constantly pivoting up and down means these lines are rubbing on each other all the time so they will eventually wear through and blow everywhere all right now we're onto the back of the machine here on a bobcat and lots of other manufacturers these lights back here are not very well protected i'm guilty as anybody i've backed into you know small trees and bushes things like that and you break the covers off of these and they push inside of the housing here so that's not really a big deal but it's just it says something about the way it was run and maintained and you know when you work them out here in the woods and really get into the work sometimes you do lose track of yourself and bump into something it happens you're working in tight spots out here but uh so the next thing i'd pay attention to is the door uh, these are made out of pretty heavy steel but i have seen plenty of them caved in and dented and kinked and a lot of the newer machines are not made out of nearly as heavy steel as these older machines are and they they crunch up pretty easy so be paying attention make sure the uh, hinges work okay make sure the latch is easy to operate i was just looking at a t190 uh, a couple weeks ago at the bobcat dealership and this latch on the t190 which is the same machine with tracks on it i couldn't even get it to move so there is that they uh if you back into something really hard with the door or bow something or bend something these latches become quite hard to operate which uh that's just one more thing you got to fix now we're on to the engine here so pay attention to all your filters here i personally write all the hours and the dates i changed everything on the filters so i know how long it's been since i've changed things uh so we're getting close here to a oil and a fuel filter change, but uh, we're still in the green right now. Obviously, before you ever start the machine, when you show up, you should check all your fluids. So make sure your oil isn't super dirty or thick or crusty looking. I always uh, take a little bit on my finger, kind of rub it around, see if you can see any sparkly metal shavings in it or anything. If you can see any kind of metal flakes in the oil, I'd stay away from it unless it's a heck of a deal or you're just looking for a project so this has a four-cylinder Kubota diesel on it these have a pretty good reputation as far as I know I've never had any problems with this one knock on some wood I have replaced a starter on it um, but relatively cheap in the aftermarket check all over your engine you're gonna want to look all over the place any place you can stick your head into down around the back on the sides and the front everywhere you can looking for oil leaks or wet spots where it looks like there are some fluids leaking from your engine this one stays pretty darn dry i have noticed in the past few months that it looks like i'm starting to get a little bit of oil coming out around this fuel shut off on this machine here you can see i have some oil puddled up back here it's it's pretty dirty in there there's lots of crustiness that uh, as i've mentioned this machine needs cleaned desperately but the dirt accumulates in there over time that's normal but as you can see it's soaked with oil so you got to find the reason it's soaked with oil now because i've owned this machine for a number of years i can tell you the why reason that's wet in there is because i had a hydraulic line blow way back up underneath the cab there and it dumped gallons and gallons of hydraulic oil inside the belly pan which has nowhere to go so it basically just soaked into all the dirt that's in the machine here so when we clean it we'll have to shovel all that out of there and steam clean it off as best we can i hate wiring uh, on anything electrical nightmares drive me crazy so i always take a look at all my connectors all my connections all the wiring harnesses and stuff and you know as you can see there's no electrical tape on this thing anywhere and factories typically don't use electrical tape on anything so if you see a, a big hunk of wiring harness it's got electrical tape wrapped around it somebody's probably been into there and they might have caused some harm they might have fixed it right but you just don't know so 
uh, I'd peek that I'd peel that back if I was serious about buying a machine and I see some electrical tape all over a, a connection somewhere I'm gonna go ahead and unwrap that and see what they've done underneath there because somebody's been in there and tampered with it next thing is your air filter I would also check this before I start the machine but for the purposes of this video we're gonna check it now these do get dusty it's not uncommon to pull one of these out and be able to knock it out like this filter in your sweeper but they are easily cleaned, easily changed. For the most part, I just blow these out. Uh, this one is getting quite a number of hours on it now, so I probably will replace it next. But there's two filters on most machines. You got your outer filter, now there's an inner filter. And that's how I usually tell if it's time for a new filter versus just blow it out. And there's gonna be people in the comments arguing that you should never blow out a filter, but I think those are just uh, claims that the dealership tells you so that you spend more money on filters. Uh, I've worked on multi, multi-million dollar projects with some massive, massive contractors and the grease guy always comes around on the machines and blows them out with an air hose. So I don't think there's any issues with that. That right there, yeah, it's dusty, but honestly, it's not that bad. I've seen, you know, when you pull the filter out of the housing, a shovel full of dirt fall on the ground with it. So if that happens yeah i'd probably question the air filter but like i say once you pull out your secondary filter that's what really tells the story you know you can have a shovel full of dirt come out of the primary filter and that's really not uncommon now if you pull out this secondary filter and it has dirt on it that means there's a hole in your primary filter and there's a chance a small chance that you may have gotten some dust into your engine which will wear out an engine quick, fast, in a hurry. So I look at this secondary filter here, and it still appears to be clean. So that's a good sign. Nothing. So primary filter is still all right. The next thing you're going to want to look at on your machine and your in the engine compartment here is your radiator. Now radiators on skid loaders can be mounted in a variety of places. The case I just picked up from my buddy last week or a couple weeks ago, whatever that was now, there's a video on it on the channel, but his radiator is mounted right on the back door here. So as I said before, if somebody caves in the back door, good chance they can bow your radiator and it's going to crack on you. Bobcat radiators are mounted up here as well as your hydraulic cooler. So. This thing you're seeing right here is not actually the radiator, that's the hydraulic cooler. On this machine, this is a steel hydraulic cooler. So all these fins and the tubing that runs through the fins, uh, those are all steel. Now, last year, I think it was, I had to seriously clean this one out because it had been full, filled up with pine needles as I parked it under a pine tree for a, a year or so. The machine had just gotten full of pine needles. And what that did was hold moisture in there and get some rust on this uh, cooler. Now, it's not leaking yet, but I noticed last year when I cleaned it out that there was some pitting on some of the pipes that run through the cooler. So there is a chance that uh, that's going to rust through in some point and just blow hydraulic fluid everywhere. The radiator in this machine is underneath the hydraulic cooler. Hard for you guys to see on camera, but uh, there is some junk under it again. I'm gonna have to pull this cooler out yet again and sweep that off, but that's pretty common in these machines, especially running them in the woods. You're always getting junk sucked up against the radiator. And uh, in this setup, the radiator is not vertical, it's laying down kinda, so it just attracts dust and leaves and debris and everything that much easier. Your coolant on this machine, you don't have a typical automotive radiator cap that has like a blow off. This is a degas bottle, and this is how you check the antifreeze in this machine. And probably really hard for you guys to tell, but uh, according to this little decal, we are in the green. So an easy trick you can do to check for a blown head gasket too is uh, remove the radiator cap before you get any pressure in it. Remove the radiator cap and then start the machine up and let it run at like a medium idle and just sit here and watch the fluid in there and if you start seeing air bubbles coming up through the fluid then there's a good chance you have a blown head gasket something else to check back here on your engine is your water fuel separator 
So right here on the bottom of the fuel filter, there's a little nut on most machines, and you can just twist this thing loose and watch the fluid that comes out of there. So in this case, it looks like nice clean red diesel. There's no water in the fuel system. That's a really good sign. Now, if you just get a few drops of water out of there, that is not a big deal. Um, you just, I'm kind of using that as something you can look at the color of the fuel and see if maybe there's an algae problem with the machine. Because if you don't know, diesel fuel will grow algae in it, and that can be an awful pain to get rid of sometimes. You'll have to completely drain the fuel system and clean it and run all kind of additives through it. And uh, I've heard of machines that are pretty much just cursed with algae, and it's almost impossible to get rid of them. Knock on wood, I've never had a problem. Uh, there are, like I said, additives you run to avoid that. So over here on the other side of the machine, we have a cylinder that is leaking. I don't know if you guys can tell real well, this cylinder has got oily dust all over it. The whole cylinder is coated in it. And what's happened is the seals uh, here have started to give out, and when you have the boom up in the air, it lets a little bit of hydraulic oil come out with it. So that's on the list of things that need to be fixed this winter. I'm gonna take that cylinder off. I'm probably gonna actually take all of them off and uh, put some new seals in them. Really not a big thing to do. That doesn't concern me too much. Um, but again, that just depends on your handiness level. If you feel like that's something you're willing to tackle, not a big deal. The parts aren't real expensive. I think I was looking at a seal kit on eBay that had the seals to do all four cylinders on this machine for like 120 bucks or something. So really not a big deal. If you were to send that same cylinder to a hydraulic shop and have them professionally redo it, I think you're looking at maybe $150, $200 per cylinder. So still not terribly priced, but definitely can save a few bucks by doing it yourself. So the last thing I uh, can't show you today, but I'll throw a clip in of me working on this machine just last week. Most machines, the cab can flip up on them. Uh, in fact, I don't think I know of any machines that the cab can't open up somehow on. And that gains you access underneath the cab to all the hydraulic lines, your drive motors, and all that stuff. And you can really tell a lot by looking at the condition of all that under there. As I said, mine's covered in hydraulic oil and dirt right now. But even that's not a terrible thing as long as it's not like fresh. You know, mine you can tell is from a blown line. It's soaked in. It's it's not fresh. It's not liquid still. It's, it's just coated everything. So... Open that up, check all your hoses, look at the condition of the hoses. You know, if they're dry rotted and the hoses have cracks all through them, hoses are expensive. I, I haven't had a hydraulic hose made even a quarter inch one for under 60, 80 bucks in the last few years. Uh, pretty much every hose that you're going to buy is going to cost you quite a few dollars. So that uh, if all your hoses are cracked and dry rotted, that's a serious chunk of change to replace those, not to mention the downtime and the uh, your time to work on it or pay somebody else to work on it so definitely think about that we're gonna go ahead and put this machine in the barn now and go take a look at a track machine <laughs> So here we are looking at a bit bigger machine. This is a T300 Bobcat. So the T is for tracked. And this is a real rubber track undercarriage. These machines, this is quite a bit larger than mine too. I believe this machine weighs about 11,500 pounds. Mine weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000 something, almost 8,000. This machine belongs to my neighbor. This is a good example of a foot control machine only. So the wrists up here, your hands don't do anything but control your uh, tracks forward and backward and your foot pedals down there run your boom. So if you're looking to buy one of these rubber track machines, you gotta take a good look at these tracks. Uh, I think these things can run about 2,000 a side, somewhere around that. Depends on uh, what style of track you get and where you get them from. So you look at the, the depth on these grousers here and this, this particular track, I'd say, is probably about 80, 85%. Uh, these are still pretty new, got a lot of life, in them, life left in them. So uh, you're going to look at the depth of the tread. You're going to look at down in this area, how tore up these are, how much rubber's left down around the, uh, the chain that goes around the inside of this rubber track. 
and you're going to look for cuts and tears. If these things are run in a lot of like rocky conditions or you know broken building material and rubble, these things will have big gouges and chunks taken out of the track, and slices in them and everything else. Uh, the same thing on the inside here. You're going to have to really pay attention. If you've got any broken links, you'll see some distortion in the track. I wish I had an example to show you, but you can uh, definitely tell when you got a busted link in there. These tracks will look real cattywampus, and uh, usually it'll pop off pretty easy when there's a busted link. Now to check your actual undercarriage on these machines, the easiest thing to do is jack it up with the bucket here and get that off the ground. If these tracks are real loose, that's a sign that maybe you have a bad adjuster. It also could just mean they have it improperly adjusted. You gotta pay attention to stuff like that. I've seen a few issues on these style of machines where the frame cracks in this area. There's not a lot of meat right up here holding the idler in, so I'd look for that. Your idler, uh, while you're driving the machine, you should pay attention if you hear any squeaking, uh, bad bushing noises. This idler wheel in here that the track rides on has a big pin and bushing inside of it, and uh, if that goes bad, the track will weeble wobble back and forth. All these small rollers down here, while the machine's up in the air, go ahead and give those a roll. They should feel stiff but not tight, and they shouldn't have any kind of rumble or noise to them. These ones all feel, well, that one's bad right there. Perfect example, bad roller. So the bearing shot in that thing, and that needs replaced. So you have another idler down here at the bottom. This particular one is seeing a good bit of wear on it. It's got these kind of divots that are matching the track grooves here. So you have one of these bars every couple inches. That is what engages in your drive sprocket here. And this rear idler is getting quite a bit of wear to match the chain. It kind of has some divots there. It's not bad, it's not gonna hurt anything, but that's not the way they come. So you can just tell that's got some wear on it. The last thing to check while you're down here is your drive sprocket. This one here, you kind of look and see, make sure your teeth are uh, symmetrical. They will wear on one side, and these guys here, wearing, worn right here a bit. They got a deeper throat in this side than this side, and uh, you can tell that this is getting a bit gapped. Not bad, there's, there's still probably, this sprocket's probably 80% probably still. They probably replaced these sprockets when they did this track. This machine is also a great example of bad bushings in your tilt cylinders here. Watch the tilt cylinders and how they move independently from the quick attach plate when I run them in and out. bushings are very bad and they're probably so bad that they've worn into the cylinders and they probably can't be replaced without sending to a machine shop. Now the last thing I can think to tell you guys about here is to listen to your drive motors and your hydraulic pump. If you go to run a bucket function like this and it sounds like it's really laboring the engine, like it makes the engine really work hard, you could have a pump going bad or if the engine doesn't make any noise at all, like you're not doing any load onto the engine, then your hydraulic pump could be bypassing. You could be also having a bad hydraulic pump. Now your drive motors are just a hydraulic motor that run off of your pump. So if they make all kind of noise when you're running them back and forth, or if you seem to have more power on one side than the other, you could also have a drive going bad. So the best way to test the drive motors that I know of without, you know, diagnostic tools that a tech would only have is hopefully you have a place you can run the machine around and actually get to use it a little bit before you buy it. If you get a big bucket of dirt or find a pile you can push into and you're running both drives forward, like I said, if one feels weaker than the other one, you'll feel the resistance in your hands. If one feels weaker than the other one, you could have a drive going bad. In these particular machines, it could also be an adjustment, but I'd definitely be leery. And like I said also, if one side makes a lot of noise, kind of whining sound, uh, that's also a sign they're starting to go bad. 
So if you're looking at a more modern machine, a lot of these bigger ones over a certain horsepower are gonna have some sort of exhaust after treatment for pollution levels. Uh, they either have just a regular exhaust filter or they have a DEF system, which will take the diesel exhaust fluid and you gotta put it in every X amount of hours. It depends on how hard you're working the machine. But there's a lot of problems with those systems and uh, they've been getting better, but they're still pretty problematic. So me personally, I avoid that stuff, but people run them every day. So it's inevitable. You might have to get one, but just uh, do your do your research on those. I really don't know enough about them to advise you on them, but uh, they can be very, very costly to repair. And I know that the filters in them have to be sent away and cleaned and that gets very expensive and they're only really good for so many hours so if you're looking at a machine that has a DPF filter or a DEF system on it look at the manufacturers um, information on it and see how many hours that system is rated to run before it needs serviced because as I said they'd be very expensive to send away and get cleaned well, that ended up being a much longer video than I anticipated, and I'm sure I still missed plenty of things. Uh, I do these videos just kind of off the top of my head, so uh, my thoughts aren't always the most organized. Uh, sometimes I forget stuff, so if you are watching this video and you're in the market for a new machine, check down in the comments. I encourage you to definitely read through the comments because there's going to be lots of people adding uh, other things that I probably missed or didn't think of. So. That's, uh, that's about the best I can advise you though. Good luck to you. I definitely recommend having a skid steer in your arsenal. If that's the only machine you've got, you can get a lot done with one piece of equipment. And uh, I could never live without one ever again. <laughs> so, that's all for today guys. If you liked the video, don't forget to give me a thumbs up. It really helps the channel out. Hit subscribe if you like this kind of content. And I will see you guys on the next one. Thanks for watching. Later.